I would like to discuss to you today a topic that I frequently hear in the halls of my university. Do engineers really need a liberal arts education? Often, I find myself involved with many students who are struggling with certain subjects, philosophy, history, languages, and often these are students who have strong passion for science, for engineering. This anecdote plays a very strong role in my life. Often, in common jargon, we, are put, we put ourselves in different dichotomies. This is a science person or artistic person. And even within sciences, we are either right-brained or left-brained. And often in the conversation, what is lost is how these two work together. The right brain and the left brain does not operate in a vacuum. They operate with an exchange with one another. And to help analyze the question, why? Why do we need to have a liberal arts education as engineers, as scientists? I will tell you my story. I was born in the United States to Syrian students who came from a very different cultural background to help explore their own horizons, to experience new things, to learn, to hear other stories, to share their own story. And this was a tenant of my life that continued with me. Spending half of my childhood there, we moved to Dubai because my parents wanted to offer me and my older sister a new set of experiences, a new way of learning about the world. I learned Arabic by living here. I learned about different cultures. Dubai is a beautifully diverse city. But I also learned a lot about myself. Going through, through middle school and high school, I loved what I was studying. I loved all of what I was studying, math and history, philosophy and language, science, biology, chemistry, physics. And I decided I needed something else. I needed something new. I needed something to challenge me more. And so I decided to apply and I got accepted to Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts. My school, the oldest private school in the United States, was a great place for me to grow as an individual, for me to experience a truly liberal arts curriculum. I was a kid in the candy store. There were so many things I wanted to enroll in. There were so many classes I wanted to take, but too little time. There were so many clubs I wanted to join, but again, I had so many limitations because of that. I was part of the Philomathian Society, the oldest debate club in the United States, but I was also part of the Science Club. I was active in Model UN and student government, but I was also really interested in the Motorsports Club. And this way of thinking, this way of, of how I interacted with my community and with my intellectual pursuits continued to the point where people asked me, who are you? Who are you? This question was, was so important to me that at Andover, we had a beautiful, excuse me, we had a beautiful dining hall. It had four identical halls, but each had a totally different personality because of those who, who sat in each hall. We had the lower left, who had all the creative geeks. You had, you know, the drama theater and drama theater people, and you had lower right who had all of the athletes and jocks and popular people. You had upper left, where the faculty sat, and the teacher's pets and the nerds, and you had the upper right, where you had all the lower classmen. Honestly, I never found myself sitting in the same dining hall twice in a row. I always changed the, the hall I chose to dine in. I always changed the people I sat with, the people who I chose to associate with, to hear their stories and share my story. Because learning is not only in the classroom, this sense of, of identity, this question that, was, that came to me, who am I, per continued through my college admissions process. I didn't know if I wanted to go into the sciences or into the humanities, and this is a question that I decided to go through for the humanities. I decided to go to the American University in Washington, D.C. I decided to go for diplomacy. This is the beautiful college, the School of International Service. It's fantastic, and I loved being there. I studied there for a year and a half. We studied history and philosophy, languages, pa so many important things to, to know, to be able to analyze the world and understand ourselves more deeply. But funnily enough, I found myself limited. I found myself limited 
within the humanities, which is often cited as the gray area, while science is the black and the white and the correct and the incorrect, one or zero. But I found myself limited in the humanities. I had some hunger for, and craving for science, for physics, to understand how things work, not why things work, how they work. So I shifted my orientation to studying engineering, and this is where I am today. I have no regrets. I absolutely love studying engineering, but I also spend a lot of my time reading and learning about how we as a society operate on the human level. And I realized that it wasn't always this way. Education was not always about this or that. It was about, it was about both and and. <coughs> Historically, to be considered an educated person, a learned person, you have to have a lot of knowledge about a lot of subjects. Today, many people have a lot of knowledge about a very small number of subjects. On the far right, or far left for you, we have Leonardo da Vinci. He pioneered so many different subjects, including art and philosophy, engineering, math. He was a Renaissance man, someone who was a jack of all trades, who knew so much about so many things in life, and was so curious. We have Thomas Jefferson, an Enlightenment thinker, one of the America's statesmen, one of the first presidents of the United States, and that's often how, how, who, what he is remembered for. But he was also an architect, a surveyor, a lawyer, a philosopher, a writer, a musician. He was the first Secretary of State of the United States of America. And a testament to that was that in his later years, they learned that he was studying Arabic. Arabic in the year 1778. Amer Morocco was the first country to recognize the United States of America. And he realized it was important to be able to understand the other tongue, to the other sense of language, in order to be a more human leader. And finally, we have Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a central figure in the French Revolution. He too was a composer, not just a philosopher. So you get the trend. People who were educated used to be passionate about so many things and used to, to be considered an intellectual person. You had to have a scope that was wide and eclectic. So when did this occur? When did this sense of pigeonholing an individual to one or the other begin? Well, it starts in the Industrial Revolution of Europe. For the sake of optimization and this vast and rapid social changes occurring in Europe, socially, technologically, and nationally, people decided that they would have to choose their education for their career. There was, it was, there was a commercial value to education, as opposed to having an intellectual and personal drive to learn, to experience, this is when, this period, the 19th century, is when the engineering departments and faculties around the world started springing up. You had MIT established in this century, for example. But during this sense of, of specialization, we've lost a lot of what makes us human. And at, at the individual level, you had people who were striving for nature, to go back to our roots this is a testament to the Romantic period, which is the artistic and literary period that overlapped with the Industrial Revolution. So a great, a perfect case study of this, you know, often, often difficult question of are we machine or man? Are we supposed to do things thinking of industrialization first, or are we supposed to think of what makes us human first? New York City is one of the most dynamic cities on the, in, on the planet. And they have this beautiful park, Central Park, very famous. But to, to the city officials who, who were against using this prime real estate for a public park, that was a daunting task. Eventually they decided that they must use this, this prime real estate space for the good of the public, to make a public park. And the, the, the person they chose to do it, Fred Law Olmsted, believed that the park must be a public, must be a public good for all individuals, all people who were part of the city to, to use and enjoy. And while he was an architect by profession, he was a social activist by passion. After 
they decided to make the park and after they, you know, they grew all the trees and they, they set up the park, he spent his life tirelessly being an advocate to keep the park public, to keep the park accessible to all. So while an architect, he was also a social activist. So today, how does this relate to our world today? Often in our engineering instruction, we're, we're taught to consider three major pillars when trying to attempt to answer a question, to solve a problem, to give an answer. And the first one is how can we make the design efficient? How can we make the design efficient? Now, the second one is how can we make it affordable? How can we make it economically feasible? How can we make it economically accessible? And third, the most recent addition to this structure of of problem solving in an engineering perspective is how can you make it sustainable? How can you make it sustainable? So I want all of us to participate in the following, so I hope you guys are ready. Imagine we are tasked with making a public park in a city we love. For example, Dubai, Mumbai, Sir Damascus, Syria, anywhere that comes to mind, anywhere. Often, the engineer will ask what questions? What questions come to mind? Does anyone have Anything? How big is the park? How big is the park? Any other questions that an engineer would quickly ask first or consider? Is land readily available? Is land readily available? How much? How much? That's a very good point. What resources do we have? Absolutely. Often engineers also consider, hmm, how can we make the water system efficient? How can we make the maintenance affordable? And how can we make the carbon footprint of this endeavor minimal. But there are so many questions that come to mind that engineers often overlook or are often not given the tools to assess. Who is the park meant for? Is it going to be in the very wealthy part of the town or is it going to be accessible for the working class? Another question that is often ignored is who is designed with, who is tasked with designing this park? Is it going to be the local community? Is it going to be a decision made by the people of that city who will enjoy that park or is it going to be a top-down sense of an international firm will be hired and they'll design the park and that's what you'll get. Is it going to be is it going to be maintained by mom and pop's gardening company or is it going to be run by an international conglomerate? These are just a narrow scope of how many questions arise with what seems to be a very wonderful task. Everyone loves a park. Everyone loves to be able to be part of nature within the city. So ultimately my take home message is this. How can we humanize engineering? How can we follow our obligation and our responsibility as engineers to be able to assess a very wide variety of implications that our decisions have? We have a lot, a huge responsibility on our shoulders. The decisions we make have far reaching consequences. And in order to be able to better understand the community we're supposed to serve, we have to have a strong liberal arts education foundation. We must be able to you know, take that French class in high school. And even if we fail it, we have to be able to understand the way a certain language works. We have to understand that to, to, to take a philosophy class has far reaching implications. To understand the history of a place, the, the history of a people is important to understand how we can solve problems and how we can solve problems that make a difference to all of us. So I'd finally like to leave you on this image. <coughs> Science can help us build a robot companion. And the humanities can help us understand why that's not a very good idea. <laughs> In other words, science helps us understand how our world works, while humanities empowers us to improve it. And finally, thank you, thank you all, for taking the time on, on a Saturday to be here to listen to different perspectives, to help be an active participant in the community, and to be able to take a little bit of what all of our experiences are and consider it for when you make your own decisions in your life, be it engineering or otherwise. So thank you.